I'm not interested in foundations in quantum mechanics, per se. I'm interested in quantum gravity. But I have ideas of the foundational nature about that, which um, they seem to intersect um, some of the things that the people, of, or some of the things possession was interested in, and both that were interested in looking at the possibility of a different structure for space time. So, why am I interested in a different structure for space? Let me ask, how many people are familiar with general relativity? Okay, okay, I think so. Um, so, you know, in general relativity, um, the metric is dynamic, so that the geometry of the space-time itself is a dynamical variable, and it interacts with matter. And um, it's been known for quite a while that um, there was a maximum amount of energy you could put in a region and before which um, no information can get out. What happens is that the, um, the causal structure of the space-time shifts to the point where the light cones turn in. And what that means is that in is the future and out is the past. So no information gets out of the region. Now, this interfaces with quantum mechanics in an interesting way. Quantum mechanics, of course, is this absolutely critical problem of the role of the observer. And the observer had better be not part of the system. Because uh, I don't even want to think about it. Observer inside the system. You get into many worlds things. So, um, if you're going to do quantum mechanics of gravity, if you're going to do experiments on, on general relativity, and you're going to treat it as quantum mechanical, you have to have an observer which is outside the region, um, which observes something about the geometry of the region. Now, when you put general relativity and quantum mechanics together, something very interesting happens. It's been known for an extremely long time. Which is that in quantum mechanics, the more you localize something, the more energy you have to put into it. It becomes more massive if you localize it, because it has that higher and higher momentum. Whereas in uh, general relativity, uh, the smaller a region is, the less energy you can put into it before it uh, forms a black hole and enough information can get out. It's called its Schwarzschild radius. Um, so there's a point where these two lines cross. And when that happens, you can't do an experiment at all. Because if you, t if you, if you have a region that's, significantly, that's sufficiently small, Anything that goes in, it will have enough energy to create a black hole and then if no information comes out. So there's no experiment at all from the outside. This has been known for a very long time. But it's a very, very fine scale. We have no hope of actually make, re reaching it in a real experiment. It's incredibly teeny. I'm going to even tell you how many zeros. Let's just say incredibly teeny. Um, Nevertheless, any finite fundamental scale changes the nature of the continuum. It doesn't matter if it's very small, it's still finite. Uh, the continuum with its infinite self-similarity, -sim which has led um, the foundations of mathematics into a model that's much worse than the one in physics. Um, we really don't know what we mean by the real numbers, by the way. Um, uh, But it, it means that there has to be some fundamental change.
change in the foundations. Now, gravity, when you try to turn it into a quantum theory, behaves very badly. And the reason is that the fine scale, the, 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 the low distance and therefore high energy um, modes add up to things that are very infinite. And so the expressions you write down to try to calculate anything physical diverge. This happens for the other quantum field theories too. We're able to patch them up with a series of tricks. But the, at the end of the day, we don't know what the fundamental theory is. We think the theory we see is only an effective theory. And so these problems of the continuum are quite bad already with the quantum theories we already have. But they become really intractable with gravity. So that's another reason to think that the fine scale structure is something different from a point set continuum. And finally, there's some more recent work about the entropy of black holes. And it's believed that all the entropy of a black hole, the information loss, um, really lives on its skin. And you get the right answer, the answer that where the, you get a second law of thermodynamics, if you cut off the um, variations around the skin of the black hole at the Planck scale. And otherwise, you would get that the answer is infinite, so it would have an infinite entropy, which doesn't work with the black hole thermodynamics picture at all. But there's nothing really special about the skin of the black hole. It's a non-local effect. Locally, it's just regular old space-time. So that's another indication that there really is something else going on at some small but finite physical scale. And that um, the point set model is, is, is hopelessly too naive. And there are also physical arguments, which I've made in other conferences given by this group where I, I would argue that the idea that the, the point set is given a priori, it's absolute, is very problematic. I want to say a region means over there. So localization of regions should be relative to observers. Now, what you mean by over there depends on the metric, because you, you point and you, you, know, you can follow the line, and if the metric is curved, it goes somewhere else. So if you have two different observers, that say, over there, the consistency between what they'll come up with depends on the metric. Well, that's all very well and good if you have a metric. If it's quantized, then you have a probability amplitude for different metrics. So there are no longer a fixed set of absolute regions in a larger region, absolute subregions, which are uniformly well-defined for all observers. So all of this together points to the notion that we somehow want to replace the, um, the point set as the foundation of the continuum. And I think this is foundational by reason. I don't know if I, maybe I should be apologizing for inviting myself to this, but, but um, uh, I think it counts as foundational in some, some reasonable sense. And there's at least a lot of overlap in that there's interest in, in this community also in replacing the points that continue with the Taubos, although for somewhat different reasons. Um, so, um, as of six months ago, I would have said that what I was going to try to do was to construct a Taubos that would describe a physical space. If you have a region in space time, it really isn't a point set anymore. You can't see the points, so they're not there. So taking just the information that can come out, Uh, and synthesize this into a geometry. And that should be the geometry that we quantize. There's only such geometry as external observers can see because the relationship between system and observer is absolutely fundamental for any kind of mechanical theory. But in working this out, so in order to do this, I had to come up with a conjecture for, what, for a form for the information. So, um, actually, it was due to some conversations with Chris Eichen that I got pointed in the direction of studying something called gravitational lensing. So, what I want, I, I, I've proposed as a foundation for all this. You see, I can't get anywhere unless I can start out by saying 
And this is the information we can see. Now, since it's a quantum mechanical system, it isn't really all the information you can see. It just has to be one basis in Hilbert space, so one set of commuting operators, as we've been discussing. So I came up with a conjecture that all of the information that can pass from the small quantum region to the outside is given by the multiple images of the gravitational lensing experiment. So let me just try to say this very simply. If you had this little region, you would hold it up to the light, okay? And you would see what you saw. And what you see will be multiple images of what you see before. Generically, you get multiple images when you uh, look at a, a, a source in the background through a highly curved region. And in fact, the astronomers have pictures of this. There are books now, one half of which is abstract mathematics, and the other half is beautiful pictures of the cosmos, because we can really see this. And it has very interesting characteristic kinds of patterns. So I'm making what I call the telescope microscope analogy. I'm saying maybe the very small region is a lot like uh, what we're seeing through telescopes. When we, we look at a distant galaxy through a nearer galaxy, and we see multiple images. And even we see parts of Einstein rings. And we see folds in the sky. OK. So I want to say that the multiple images contain all the information that you can get out. That doesn't mean it's the only thing. I believe that there's a complementary thing you can do, which is if you had energetic processes originating inside the region and observe them from many different um, angles, like a jet of particles, um, then you could notice direction and time of arrival, and from that you could do something about the internal geometry. I'm proposing that that's complementary. So the physical intuition is that one is like a beam, and the other is like a, a localized state, and we know those are complementary in ordinary quantum mechanics, so maybe they're complementary in gravity too. You have to guess something. So that's what I'm guessing. So, lens, uh, so there's the lensing hypothesis. Um, uh, the information coming Span by the multiple images of a source in background. It's a little lens, maybe in some sense that's almost all it is, and the image of the lens described, it's all the information about the jam that you're going to get. And uh, so we want to construct some geometry that's spanned by that information. And in order to do that, we need a version of the topology. We need topology, quantum topology, and then, then quantum geometry on it. So what do we want? Desiderata. So if we have a region, it should assign some mathematical object to Q of R. So what am I thinking here? I'm one of the people who's happy with quantum mechanics because I believe we shouldn't expect anything except a mathematical structure and a dictionary. So we translate our um, data to describe our experiment into the mathematical structure, do the calculation in it, translate back, and that gives us the answer. And I don't think we should expect anything else from a physical theory, because our intuitions are, um, you know, formed by a very, very narrow range of physical phenomena. We shouldn't expect to understand it intuitively. If we have a mathematical structure, it's elegant, and it answers the problems. That's what a theory is. Um, but on the other hand, although we don't expect to have an intuition for it, we have a right to expect, and indeed according to Bohr, we have to demand that we get back the old picture in some limit. So, in some limit, we should be able to 
get back something like our intuitive, intuitive feeling for continuum space time, namely the limit when you look at things that are coarse grained enough that the quantum phenomena in the Planck scale don't matter. <coughs> um, so that's something to wish for. So I want an elegant mathematical structure which will contain just this information and nothing else and which is enough like a piece of topology that I can do reasonable things with it. So we need this. Now if we have a map, then we need to get some way to include. So we need maps on quantum regions, whatever the hell they are, um, to uh, correspond to maps here. And finally, there's an absolutely critical principle, and I find it penultimately, there's an absolutely critical principle at the heart of relativity, which uh, the old-fashioned way of saying it is it's coordinate invariance. It's now understood as diffeomorphism invariance. So the theory of relativity is invariant under the action of diffeomorphism. Well, diffeomorphism is a species of homotopy. If you're in the smooth category, your, your diffeomorphisms can be thought of as homotopies. And I should warn you, mathematicians like to do homotopies on maps instead of spaces, but you can just take the identity. So, you know, the idea that you can smoothly deform it is adequately explained by a homotopy. So, diffeomorphism. So we have to have an internal notion of, 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 of homotopies to express that. One, two, three, four. Finally, uh, must... So, sorry, I mean, the diffeomorphism group is not necessarily connected. Isn't aren't homotopies somehow in the identity component of diffeomorphism? Yeah, I only want the it's right. I only want the identity component. You're correct. Right. Okay. Yes, no, you're right. Sorry, I should have said that right. Thank you. Uh, must contain info on multiple lensing and be uh, determined by it. So, that's, um, that's what I would like. That's the way I'm thinking about it. If I want to have an abstract mathematical structure, and then finally, I would like to be able to analyze this and have it come back and give me something that will look like a space time in some way. Okay. So it turns out that this is an extremely fortunate wish list. Because I, 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 I can get it. I can just open the book and instead. The mathematicians already constructed this. Exactly this. And the reason is that the lensing problem is very closely related to a very important problem uh, that topologists studied in a particular branch of homotopy theory. So a plane, a uh, rational uh, homotopy theory solves this in several equivalent ways through model category theory. What this boils down to is saying that I want a model category for the rational homotopy type. And we have those, and they're very interesting structures. Okay, why is that so? So there's a string of coincidences here. Once you assemble all the background in one place, it's actually obvious. Does uh, anybody already see why? Can you already guess? No. Okay. Yes, okay. It's only obvious once you've seen it. Um, Sorry, can I just, uh, number three, I'm, I'm very confused to number two and number three. What's the difference? This is a map mm -hmm. from one region to another. Now, I've written this as a, a, a diffeomorphism. What I really should have said 
was a smooth home into a smooth isotopic from one map to another. Okay. So actually, it's a two category. But I just I just made it too simple. But it's it's a smooth deformation. That's not the same as a map. It's a one parameter family of deformations. You probably know that spaces, maps, and homotopies are a two category. Okay. So this is a two category. Okay. So this turns out to be um, this is the work of Quillen. And then solve it. Okay. And uh, I want to try to explain this, just the big picture. I have to explain a whole bunch of math in a hurry late at night when everybody's hungry. Um, but um, let me just say that what I believe comes to I have I've worked out the topology. I haven't worked out how you put either. <coughs> general relativity or matter fields on it, but what I can say at this point is there's some extremely interesting and plausible approaches. It seems to be closely related to the problem of, 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 of state sum models, my earlier work with, with John Barrett. Um, uh, so I, I'm optimistic about that, that it's not done yet. But I'm going to conjecture, after I tell you what we get here, what we get here is actually what are called minimal or um, minimal and uh, uh, contractible Sullivan algebras. Okay. So that's what we get out at the end of the day. And what I'm going to claim is that they have a very interesting structure, which if gravity does what common sense says it ought to do, it's going to mean that they end up looking like, like, like big crystals, so that you, you might get the regularity of space-time coming back out of the algebra in the limit. It, it, it's certainly the most plausible thing that they ought to do. Um, but of course, I can't say that they do that. I can just conjecture it until I've really worked out how to do geometry on these things, which, which is going to be quite some doing. So I want to sort of explain this. So the first point is you have to understand Morse theory. And how it applies to lensing. OK, how many people know about Morse theory? Oh, okay. Most people know about Morse theory. So you know that when you have a Morse function on space, what you're looking at it really is a handle body decomposition in the space. And it at least gives you a basis for the rational cohomology. It can give you more because a perfect Morse function would just give you the rational cohomology. But you can add in surf theory, you can add in pairs of canceling handles. So it could be a basis for the rational cohomology plus uh, pairs of things that cancel in pairs. So it's got something to do with some kind of rational cohomology. Okay? Uh, now what I want to say is that Lansing corresponds to Morse theory on, I will just say, the loop space of the region in space time. That's slightly sloppy. It's really a path space, but it's the same homotopy type. Path space is the same homotopy type as loop space. So we're looking at rational cohomology, but not rational cohomology of the space, rational cohomology of the loop space. So it turns out the whole subject of rational homotopy theory developed around solving the problem of computing the rational cohomology of the lip space. And in fact, there's a very celebrated theorem due to Sullivan, which says that if you have a Riemannian manifold, under which circumstances you have an infinite number of closed geodesics. So this is more or less the same problem. It's a typical thing. The mathematicians do the Riemannian case, and then the physics, you have to go to the Lorentzian signature. But there is a modification of Morse theory to the case of Lorentzian signature, so space times, 
uh, was actually first worked out many years ago by my advisor, Karen Ellen Beck. And more recently, it's been done with very sophistication by Perley and I'll um, He actually did the more mathematically sophisticated version, she, despite being one of the <coughs> students of the great guru of, uh, of uh, global geometry actually did it the old-fashioned way by breaking the thing up into finite pieces. But, um, I'll, uh, I mean, if you're going to learn this, there's a book by um, Milner called Morse Theory. That it does the Romanian case, but very nicely. Okay, so, counting the number of images boils down to this problem of finding the rational cohomology. It's very important I keep saying rational. If there's any torsion in the cohomology, it plays no role. These are real functions. They, they, they see the handle body decomposition, they don't see the torsion. Now it turns out, homotopy theory is a very difficult field, and very subtle. If you throw away the torsion, it turns out to be an amazingly simple field. So there's, there's a technical way of doing this. You can take the category of topological spaces and you can formally add in inverses to all the weak homo the rational homotopy equivalents. So if you have a function which is the identity on rational cohomology, you add a formal inverse, you get a new category. It's passing to a quotient category. This is called the category of rational homotopy types. It's also possible to start out with a space and map it into its rationalization. You kill off all the torsion and get something which is with only rational cohomology. Rational, for all practical purposes, is the same as real. Sometimes the mathematicians even like to say, if coefficients in any field of characteristic zero, I don't know if the physicists love it when they do that, but it's pretty much the same picture. You get the same class as one makes another. Um, so, it's only the rational homotopy type of the space-time which is observable by looking at the multiple images. So if you really believe my hypothesis that says the space-time is exhausted as far as its quantum theory for outside observers by its multiple images, then the space-time can be replaced by its rational homotopy type. So, this is one of those cases about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. So, the rational homotopy category now this is due to Quillen that has, there's a whole string of adjoint functors which are equivalences in homotopy. So in other words, this category, as far as homotopy type is concerned, is equivalent to some superficially completely different ones. And they're all equivalent to one another, and it goes both ways. So if you have a, one of these things, you can also get the space. And, uh, well, one of them is uh, differential, graded, reduced. Co-algebras. So what you do actually, the first thing you do is this turns out to be equivalent to the rational homotopy category of simplicial complexes. And then from that you get reduced co-algebras, and then you get to simplicial uh, uh, simplicial groups. What you're doing here is you're taking, for passing from, from simplices to strings of simplices. And effectively what you're doing is you're going from the space to its loop space. The way to get a 
good representation of the category of homotopy types is to replace the space by its loop space because its loop space is an algebraic structure. So the topologists already shifted focus from the space to its loop space for purely mathematical reasons because that's going to get an elegant answer. But of course if I'm doing uh, lensing, I'm not doing Morse theory on the space, I'm doing Morse theory on the loop space. I'm looking at paths, I'm, I'm seeing only handle body decompositions of the space and paths because that's what the multiple images are. So the path space becomes more fundamental. And in the math, that's just perfect because then this thing, you can turn this into a differential graded of algebra and this is called commutative. Okay. And then from that, you can turn it into a differential graded Lie algebra. And all of these are equivalences. This is the universal enveloping algebra of this. And this is pi of x tensor q. It's, it's the rational homotopy theory. The rational homotopy theory is a Lie algebra because there's this skew commutative product called the Whitehead product. Its universal enveloping algebra is the cohomology of the loop space. So it's a free algebra built on the homotopy theory. Rational homotopy theory is very simple. There is not one simple space except the trivial one where we know all the cohomology and all the homotopy. But you take any reasonable space and we know all the rational cohomology and all the rational homotopy. And the way we know all that is we take the space and we replace it by an algebraic model. These algebraic models are very simple, they're very computationally powerful, they're at the heart of this whole branch of homotopy theory. And they're rather small. So, so are you restricted to simply connected spaces? Yes, I am. Yes, I'm simply connected yeah. spaces. Sorry. I should have said that. Thank you. You knew that. That's good. Simply do that. Yeah, yeah. I, in the non simply connected case, you can do it in some cases, but it's much harder. But I'm, 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 I'm willing to rule out um, uh, wormholes. That's the, the non simply connected uh, space times are wormholes, and they're, they're really awful, and they're very causal. And, you know, so I'm just happy, completely happy to. Um, and then uh, uh, and then Sullivan came along later and he started out this is a homology and so it's a co-commutative Puff algebra and he started out with polynomial forms So if you have a triangulated space, uh, you uh, these are these simplices are supposed to have canonical coordinates on them. So you know what you mean by polynomial differential forms on them, and then you glue that together and you get this algebra. So this triangulation I'm calling sigma of r, I'm oversimplifying, but uh, you have this algebra attached to it, and then from that you can construct. A, a Huff algebra, and it's dual to this guy, so it's commutative. Now, Sullivan then went on and said, I can construct minimal models for these. I can reconstruct homotopy equivalent things in this form that contain only the topology and practically nothing else. They're called Sullivan algebras. So these have minimal forms and they're called Sullivan algebras. And these are differential graded algebras so, and they are free. This is what's so wonderful. These are free objects. The category reduces to a category of free objects. If you tried to do the same thing for general homotopy theory, you wouldn't. I mean, this isn't true at all. But they are remarkably simple objects, differential grade and free. And now a general Sullivan algebra is the 
direct sum of a minimal algebra, and that's essentially unique. The, the minimal form is unique up to isomorphism. It's completely determined by the homotopy term. So you get one free algebra, or you can construct a Hopf algebra out of it. And that's that, that uniquely defines the, the, the homotopy type. So in other words, all the information that we would get out of the region could be um, just grafted onto that relatively very simple algebraic structure. So it's minimal direct sum, what's called contractible. Now a contractible self in algebra, it's also free, and it has a basis of things like this. So of course it has no cohomology because they, they kill one another. And this is sort of the ghost of handle cancellations, you see. So, um, what we would see in general if we looked at, at a region, we would see some of the spots that you couldn't get rid of. Okay, so, it's known that if you have the Schwarzschild black hole, and you ask how many copies of a light source will I see, that you'll always see an infinite number of sources. This is an exact calculation. And it's due to the fact that orbits around the short chill black hole are not like Newtonian orbits. They can spiral for a while and come out again. And they, there's one that goes around three times, and one that goes around four times, and one that goes around five times. And they can go around the other way, too. So there's an infinite number of them. You can't get rid of those. But then, if there are other distortions nearby, you can also get things that, uh, where pairs of things appear, and then pairs of images appear, and then as you move, they come together and vanish at a cost it. Those are called folds in the sky. There's pictures on them. Those are coming when you have pairs of handles to cancel, which means that it's like that. So in other words, a Sullivan algebra looks very much like the structure of what you would actually see if you looked at a region. So my conjecture is we have to take the Sullivan algebra as a model for the topological structure. Okay. So I told you the object you would get would be mathematically elegant when you have just enough information. I don't yet know how to calculate. See, I need the geometry for two things. It has to tell me where the images actually show up with what probability, because they're going to be quantum mechanical. So, I, so quantum gravity on this should answer that. And the other thing it should tell me is the dynamics. So if I have two of these and they come together, gravity is going to tell me how they interact. And I don't have that theory yet, although the structure of this algebra, particularly the fact that it has a Hopf algebra form, makes me extremely optimistic that I will know how many Hopf algebras come into uh, this whole rubric of um, models, of um, state sum models for gravity in such a natural way. Uh, but that's not done yet. But now, uh, this is a free algebra. So it's a direct product of minimal pieces. It's a product of things where I have one generator, and then it's a graded Lie algebra, so that means there's one thing every, whatever the dimension is, there's one generator in every multiple of i. So that looks like a black hole. And then one thing like this, which looks like two images that, that, that because the, the handles are canceling somewhat you, you can you'll be able to see them collide and disappear so those are not topologically determined those are like folds in the sky so I'm calling those planets can you explain again how that first thing looks like a black hole okay it looks like, if you hold a black hole up to the light you see an infinite number an infinite mm -hmm. sequence of images okay so can, you, can you explain that to, to me Paul to okay, classically, classically, if you have a black hole, the light can get bent around it. But, it, you know, it's different from Newtonian orbits. So it can go around once and then come out, or twice and come out, or three times and come out, or it can go the other way around as many times as you want to come out. So there's an infinite series of images, and they get closer and closer and closer. So by gravitational lensing, you mean the... The, the flow lines of the 
Mm -hmm. That's right. And those are by Fermat's principle. They're minimal geodesics. And so they're solutions of a variational problem. So there's a Morse theory. So they correspond to a body decomposition into path space. Um, the, it's very interesting. You see, that's an exact calculation in the metric of Schwarzschild. But you might ask, what happens if you perturb it? What will happen to those images? Well, the answer is there's still going to be an infinite number of images. Do you know how we know that? We can't do an exact calculation. The topology of the Schwarzschild black hole is of the homotopy type of S2. So we have to calculate the rational cohomology of the loop space on S2. And we construct its minimal Sullivan algebra, and it has one generator, and it, 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 it recurs over and over and over again. So there's an infinite number of generators of the rational cohomology. So by the Morse inequalities, there have to be an infinite number of images. So it's purely topological fact there's an infinite number of images. But then the geometry would have to tell me exactly where I see them. Okay. That's a very remarkable fact, because people didn't know what would happen to the images. And then uh, some of the intuition that in some sense black holes are topological um, is reinforced by this. There are these books written jointly by astronomers and mathematicians about that stuff. That's a very pretty subject. But you see, okay, so this is a, a graded vector space. So you see, as a vec it's, it's an algebra, so it's a graded vector space. You've got x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth. You've got an infinite number of generators, and those are corresponding to the infinite number of images. Here, on the other hand, we only get two images because this has no cohomology, and so all these higher things cancel out. So um, you just get pairs of images. Um, that, that could disappear. They're, they're not topologically fundamental. And every Sullivan algebra, which is a free algebra, is direct sense of copies of these, just because it, it's a free graded algebra. Now it's also got a D on it, and D can put these together in interesting ways. So we're getting pictures where we've got two kinds of fundamental things. One are black holes, and the other I'm calling planets. right? And now we don't know what gravity does to them. And the planets are funny in a way that's sort of like black hole anti-black hole pairs. Um, we don't know what they do. We don't know what gravity does do. But gravity is an attractive force. So if there's any justice in life, gravity is going to make them cluster. And then they're going to form some sort of crystal structure. So physically this makes some sort of sense. If my region has little places that are like black holes and other little places that are like little regions where there's some energy concentration enough to cause multiple images, um, but, but smaller, so they only make finite sets of images like, 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 like stars do when you look past them at distant galaxies. Um, then they're going to form, you know, gravitate together and get into orbits around one another and it's going, to, it's going to be a little bit like a nucleus. So, what I would conjecture is that, that when I work out the geometry, it's going to tell me that space-time picks up some sort of texture. That Sullivan algebras looked at with this point of view with the appropriate quantum theory on them um, are going to form like crystals, and they're going to have a texture. So space-time, far from being just a continuum that's infinitely divisible, has a characteristic sort of texture. And having just two different kinds of, of uh, excitations, and one's heavier than the other in some sense, um, is enough to produce some, some interesting structures. So I believe that uh, where your intuition comes back in the limit is you're going to see that something that looks like a texture. That's all conjectural. I have a huge amount of work to do first. But uh, isn't it interesting that all this math was already here? I mean, once you ask the question, what are the gravitational images? And you say, maybe that's all there is. All this math falls out at you. It's all been done already. And you get this very pretty picture. And the category of quantum regions, K 
can be described by differential graded topology. Those are three structures. Um, so um, that's a lot of really deep math. And, um, I'm still struggling to understand all of it. But I think it's, it's an extraordinarily pretty picture. And so it says that uh, it's a little different. It isn't saying that space-time regions are a category themselves. It says they live in a category. And although this is a departure from topos theory, apparently um, there's a very, the natural thing to do with model categories is to embed them in topos, because there's a big literature called model categories in the topos. So this picture may very well come back into more contact with the kind of issues about the structures based on what people in this group have been interested in. OK, so um, that's what I wanted to say. Um, any questions? Yes? So, your basic suggestion is that we study regions by looking at what they do in, in the sense of looking at the sort of lensing effects that they produce. That's right. But in quantum gravity, we're interested, obviously, in the phenomenology of very small regions. Yes. And then, um, why would you expect, from this new perspective, to necessarily have a smallest possible region, or why would you expect from this perspective well, because new effects if I'm to come right, into play? That the regions are approximated by free algebras, then they come in minimal units. You see, uh, a free algebra is a product of one dimensional, of, of free algebras of one genre. So it comes out of the structure. If all you're inter if you believe that that's all there is to the region, okay, there's a fallback position that I call the weak lensing hypothesis, which says an important subsector of quantum gravity can be spanned by these things, and then we're just studying that sector. We're considering that we know absolutely zip about quantum gravity after 80 years, even that's worth doing. I um, it wasn't that I expected a priori that it would come up in discrete pieces like that, it's that that's what happens to the map. These, you, have, you have these very simple minimal Solomon models for these things. Uh, the construction is analogous to construction in heidelberg maclean spaces. That you, you add, it's an inductive construction where you add things in and then add in other things to kill the cohomology and so on. And you might think it would be very big, but in fact, the process in simple cases terminates very rapidly. If I had a little more time or it wasn't so late, I might compute the examples of the spheres for you. You can compute the rational homotopy theory of the loop spaces on the spheres in about three lines using this. The calculation is, I mean, it's, it's over in two seconds when you say to use it really that simple. But this powerful underlying theory tells you that it's right. And that's actually how we know everything about rational homotopy theory, because these algebraic models are so simple and computation with them is so embarrassingly simple. But see, going from the space to the loop space turned out to be the fundamental tool for getting answers about things in homotopy theory anyhow, because it pulls the homotopy down and you can see it better. Um, so the thing we want to do for the physics that was suggested by this you know, thought experiment turned out to be absolutely the core object of study already in the topology. So this is one of the points of it. Sorry, uh, yes? Let's see if I can get the bigger picture again. So, I mean, you're saying you, you've got some kind of manifold M, so space-time. Right. And then to each region, you assign its Sullivan algebra. Yeah. And then how are you going to get it? Quantum gravity acts. We're, ah, okay, we're okay. going to be our this field of space. This is the foundation. So then I have to tell you how to do general relativity and also how to add matter fields on top of this. Well, there's several reasons for thinking. I, I, I haven't done that yet. I found several approaches. Uh, one way to see how you might do it is um, this Hopf algebra, which is sitting on top of this free algebra is an approximation to the loop group as a group. You see, or if it's a path space, we have to think of it as a groupoid. 
So the basic operation is sort of a, 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 an algebraic simple model for the group operation of composition of paths. So the representation theory of this Hopf algebra ought to give us an approximation to the problem of constructing representations for the path space, but that's constructing a connection. The connection is given by, it's a lot of the long paths, and then when you combine paths, it's multiplicative. So we naturally get, you see, we can also, which uh, solve and then Quillen even didn't think of doing, we could make a further replacement. We could replace the Hopf algebra by its category of graded um, representations. And I want to work that out and see what kind of structure it's got. Um, it's a natural, but then the next thing is that these things are either community or co community, depending on which duality you take. You could then look for quantum deformations of them, which has helped in the past in producing interesting representations. And since the representation theory would presumably be coming with matter, it, it might tell you something interesting. And as the kind of matter you might see might come out of the texture of quantum space time itself. But the, the other thing, including gravity, well, you know, uh, John Barrett and I did this construction where we started out, we took the manifold and turned it into a simplicial complex, and then we found a way to put general relativity there. And it's better behaved as a quantum theory there than it is in the continuum. It's fine. So there's still some issues about interpretation, but it's, it's definitely, it's considered one of the going uh, approaches to, to, I mean, people are still writing papers about it in significant numbers. Um, but one of the form, equivalent formulations of this is that you can take what's called the geometric realization. You can take this algebra and turn it back into a simplicial complex. So perhaps the most natural thing to try is to just to lift the, the state sum model onto the simplicial model for the, the loop space, which in some sense is saying uh, we have this quantum model that, that, that tells us how the dihedral angles are behaving as quantum operators. And we compose them to see what happens along a whole, a whole uh, <coughs> chain. And the, the, the loop space is built out of chains of, of, of simplices. That's the whole idea. That was done before. That was called the Kovar construction. If you start out with the space, turn it into a simplicial complex, reduce the simplicial complex, then you can get the loop space out of something called the Kovar construction. So really what we're doing is trying to lift um, state some models from the space to its Kovar construction, which is like a free algebra, over it. So this seems like a rather natural thing to try, and actually that's the reason I came here this year to try to convince John Barrett to help me try to do this, because we've been able to do things like that before. So I haven't really gone after the problem of putting the quantum field theories on top of the topology, quantum geometry, on top of the topology, but the models are close enough to space time as we understand it that there are some very natural ways to approach it. But that's all I can say at this point. Other questions? Yes. Um, right. It seems that this can all be applied to order that we see. Um, what do you think about this? Well, I mean, I, I just, in a sense, told you an example of that. Mm -hmm. That if you have a, a black hole, this is already, I mean, um, then you'll get an infinite number of images and they pass closer and closer. But also, they're farther and farther back in time because it takes a long time. Yeah. Okay. But so you, you actually have to think about the observer, what they see over all, all the time. Yeah. You see, okay. That, that's how the, okay. But anyway, you can do that. And then um, it's known for the short chill black hole that there's an infinite number of images. But nobody can calculate what happens if you've got a black hole with a planet revolving around. What would that do to the images? It could do anything. Yeah. So we have this theorem that it can't change the number. There has to be the infinite number because it doesn't change the topology. Yeah. So it already, I mean, and that's not original. All right, so it already had interesting answers like that. So now if we have two black holes in orbit, okay, so without getting tired, I can tell you that uh, 
there's going to be a huge collection of images and all possible multiple orbits where it loops around here and there around there and around here. You know, there's the free algebra generated by it. You're going to get all those images, even if there's planets and distortion and things. And to try to prove that by doing calculation would be completely impossible. But it's just proved by, by, by Morse theory. It's purely topological. Um, we know how, when we make this join, we know how the rational homotopy groups fit together. There's a theorem about that. So it, it does tell us interesting things like that, just classically. I mean, things that would be impossible to get any other way. Other questions? Okay, then. If that's okay, then I'm No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the question is roughly where is quantum gravity in your picture? I mean, which region qualify as, as those? Okay, this is uh, what I have developed here is the quantum topology. I'm saying mm -hmm. the quantum topology will be this, the, the, sol the ma model by the Sullivan algebra. And then it, I, I've said this several times. Now I have to work out a way of. Putting, I mean, look, the idea is, if you have quantum gravity, the, the quantum gravity, the theory of the quantum gravity is completely determined by the topology. It's topological in itself, because the particular states of it are what determine the geometry. So I have to construct a theory over this, which I would then have to interpret. And I, I, I've said a couple of times, I, I haven't done it yet. It's, it, it, I think it's doable. I don't know how hard it is because I haven't tried yet. Um, but actually, I, I think it, it breaks up into a lot of nice problems. I, I, I wish I had a bunch of graduates. I actually have a couple. But, um, I, I think that this will break up. The, I can see immediately how to break this up into lots of nice pieces. There's lots of nice questions really that are, that are calculable. It's a very calculable subject. That's what the topologists love about it. And of course, physicists also love things that can calculate. So it should be a lot of fair maybe. Uh, other questions? Okay, thank you so much for inviting me and tolerating this great